Okay, yeah. Um, by the way, so um, one thing we'll do, I think everyone's already downloaded the ML for AOFX. I think we did that last week, if I'm not mistaken, but just in case uh, you didn't download this, go to ML for AOFX. And then, um, actually, I'll, I'll ask you to do one thing. Um, wherever that you found ML for AOFX, um, you know, so, so go find it in Finder. Right, so I have it here. Here's mine. Basically, you should have a bunch of, of these applications, right? So um, what I'd like you to do is open terminal. Um, so you should get a terminal like this, right? And then um, basically CD into this directory. My, mine is, you should, yours should, will say ML for AOFX. I just have it kind of set up where it says release. But basically you'll, you'll just drag that folder, whatever it's ML for AFX, so that you see this stuff inside of it if you do LS. And then what I'd like for you to do is run the following command, sh setup.sh, and then just hit enter. So like you're inside the same folder as this. Now, um, if anyone doesn't know what the hell I'm doing with this whole terminal thing, this Friday I'm going to be doing a session on how to use the terminal. Uh, the thing that we're, at the, the Friday AI lab, so I would highly encourage you to to go. Is there anyone here who's like not available Fridays at three? Okay, actually quite a lot of you, no. Well, that's okay because the thing that I'm doing, I also have a video for, so, it's, so you can just watch that instead. I'll pr provide info about that. Um, a bit later. Um, can yeah. Go back and show which folder you dragged in. So um, I uh, just on my computer, I happen to have it called release, but basically it's whatever folder you have all this inside. Okay. So just drag that in, and then once you're inside that folder, you would cd into it, and you'll you'll run this command sh that set up that sh, and then actually hit enter, and what it'll do is it will download a bunch of files. That you need some data files so you should see something like this downloading shape predictor blah 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 you wrote ls right? uh you don't need to do that that was just me showing okay. yeah where we are sh, SH set up that sh so you uh you, cd space yeah mm -hmm. So you should start to get some, I guess, is anyone else having trouble? Questions? I don't have all of the apps. I just drag it, it's the root folder, right? It's the folder, yeah, yeah. Do you have these applications? No. Did you ever download this? I, I have the end of the way or the... What's inside of it? Uh, app, data... So you, you have the actual repository, not the release. So go, go to this. Go to where it says three releases and, and ML for AOFX modules. And then and then uh, down here, ML for AOFX.zip. So download that. Okay. Anybody else? Okay. So, yeah. Okay, so while you guys are doing that, I'm going to get into the slides. Okay, so we're not going to use this just now in the sec. We'll we'll get to it in the in the moment. I need to just show you a few things first, and then I'm going to show you a bunch of things in this folder. Uh, for those of you on Windows, any of the Windows people here today? Uh, let's see. Okay. Um, so get out. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> no. Um, so this, I'll be showing some of this uh, ML for OFX stuff. So that won't work for you, unfortunately, but. Uh, yeah, also, like, um, it's mostly stuff that you, we can do in other environments, but I use ML for AOFX because it's easy to demo, it's easy to demonstrate, um, so it'll still be useful. Um, and then, you know, if you do actually want to use them, like, there's a lot of Macs here, I think, right, in, in the building, so we can... So, CD, like, let's say you're in a new terminal, you do CD, that means change directory, space, and then you can drag in the folder that you want to go into, 
from Finder, or you can type it in if you want, right? And then you're inside of there, and then once you're inside of there, you would run set sh set up that sh, and then and then you should start to see stuff that looks like this: downloading ImageNet SQLite, extracting shape predictor, blah blah blah. Yeah, good. Okay. Um, everyone should uh, should really really try to get good at terminal uh, because terminal is how you can control a computer. Like. Um, yeah, it's it. Yeah. Why are we doing Why? Because we're going to be using these applications. And by um, downloading download. So when you download it, it just downloads the applications. But there's also these data files that we need, um, which it downloads from the web. So that's what setup that sh does. Okay. So I'm going to go to the slides. So basically, this is week four, I think, right? This is our fourth week. Mm -hmm. And um, so far, we've covered the kind of, like, we got into ML5. We showed Runway and Wekinator. And we kind of, like, explained how neural networks work, roughly speaking. Um, do people feel like they have a decent understanding? Are, are there any questions, let's say, from last time, like any points of confusion about how neural networks work? You know, how are they trained? Are there any like really outstanding questions that are worth you know like discussing in class? Do people have any questions? I think reading the um, extra mm -hmm. additional material helps. Mm -hmm. Apex. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Okay, a few announcements. So on Friday, uh, we're gonna do AI Lab and at 3 p.m. and I'm going to, this week it'll be the Terminal Velocity session. So Terminal Velocity is just my name for a lecture that I give on how to use it, like a deep dive into how to use the terminal. Um, and, and basically Linux or Mac terminal, it's a, uh, um, like a bash terminal. You can do this in Windows as well, so, so just even if you have Windows. Windows has a slightly different system, but you can do bash inside of Windows, so that's useful. Um, and uh, it's not mandatory, this is just an AI lab session that might be useful. Um, because, and it's just, it's not even useful for just this class, it's just useful in general if you want to be able to to install software packages in your computer, you know, if you want to be able to, um, you know, basically get underneath applications, yeah? No, um, the thing is that I, I, I was doing it at five, but, but a lot of people told me they don't like five, um, that they, that three is better. I don't know what, and then it, yeah. Okay. Well this week for sure I can't do five because I have to leave right after AI lab. Maybe we'll switch it back. Like I'm going to, I'm going to see it. Like I want to do a poll for me. It's, it's actually, I don't, it doesn't matter too much to me which which day but maybe we'll yeah maybe we'll kind of sort it out last time i asked the people at ai lab and they we took a a vote and for some reason half of them were into maybe that's because it was at 3 p.m that time so that <laughs> but um but okay we'll figure it out we'll figure it out now for this session like i said like it's not mandatory because if you want to learn this i would, would and i kind of really recommend that you do because it'll make the next few weeks actually a lot easier um, but um, if you can't make it, then do the following. Go to ML Fray. Uh, oops. Where's. Go to ML Fray.github.io and then go to classes and then go to the neural aesthetic. Um, and you'll see that I have a lecture here called Terminal Velocity which is already on YouTube, that um, more or less um, is, the, is a review of the stuff that I'll be showing live on Friday. So you can do either, either one. It's, it's about an hour long lecture and it kind of shows you how to do um, like basic terminal commands and then also uh, another thing is setting up paper space, which we may or may not do this Friday. Um, and um, yeah, so that's, that's there for you. So. So yeah, that's in the classes section. Okay, um, the office hours are one to six. I'm already booked for one to two, if anyone wants to. And then I think someone booked me at five or something like that, five or six. If anyone wants to come and chat, um, you know where to find me. And I want to announce a small uh, change in the dates. So the first week, um, I laid out the class schedule, so this is a 12-week class, so there were two weeks that are not scheduled, and I'm switching one of them. Um, so basically, earlier, the way that we had it before was that it was going to be that we were off on the, uh, November 5th, um, but, uh, or did not, yeah, did not have class on November 5th, but did have class on the uh, 19th, I think. I think that's how I switched it, yeah. So now those are switched, so now basically... Uh, we're the same until November, but we will have class on November 5th, um, and then we'll actually be off two weeks in a row. I'm going to be out of town for two weeks. So November 12th and November 19th are going to be both of the weeks that we don't have class. Uh, we also don't have class on November, uh, October 15th, but that's just built into the schedule because Tuesday is a Monday schedule. That Tuesday is a Monday schedule. So we will not, so we're meeting every week except for October 15th which I'm also gonna be out of town for, but there's no class anyway. And then uh, between November 5th and November 26th, you'll have a long, you'll have a long holiday from me. Like it'll be, it'll be a whole three weeks before we, between classes. And um, I'll be away for some, not all of it, but I'll be away for about two weeks. And um, yeah, so, so after yeah. So in November, no, no, November 5th, we will have class. Will. Uh, before, I have it in bold because Earlier, I had made it that it would be an off day, and that November nineteenth we would have class. So now, November fifth we do have class, mm -hmm. but November nineteenth we don't. 
So. And in the syllabus, it will be. Oh, that's right. I didn't change. I didn't change the syllabus. I need to. I need to write that down. Thank you for reminding me. We have twelve twenty six in the syllabus. Twelve twenty six. You mean? Twelve twelfth of November and then we have twenty sixth of November. <laughs> right, exactly. Oh, oh, sorry, yeah, yeah, I got that right. Not the 19th, but I had originally, I'm confusing myself. It was the 12th that we would have, yeah. so now it's the 12th that we won't, and the 5th that we will. Yeah, sorry about that. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, I have to change, I have to update the syllabus. Sorry about that. Um, I'll update the syllabus. Um, okay, so then, and then the midterm, it, the idea with the midterm is that, um, is that basically, uh, so we have one week uh, off on the 15th, so you'll have two weeks between the 8th and the 22nd. And basically that could be the time to put together a nice little project. And then what we'll do on the midterm day is that everyone um, will present um, like, you know, just a little piece more or less. And that will be your, your midterm project. And uh, I think, I, yeah, I wanted to write, maybe let me, let me actually go into that next. So... Um, and we'll talk about this as we get closer to them. So, uh, but I just want to kind of introduce you to this to this idea. Um, oh, another thing I should mention, I forgot to, uh, I'm having a little trouble with my web host, so I haven't been able to put the slides online. Um, I think I have figured out a solution, which will be to just put the slides on Dropbox. Um, but you can't view them, you'll have to download them. So it's a little annoying, but, but um, I'm going to do that for now until I figure out a more permanent solution for the slides. So yeah, sorry, sorry about that. The, this, the lectures have, of course, they have the slides. But anyway, back to the mini presentations. The idea is that, you know, everyone um, should do sort of like a three to five minute presentation, something like that. And um, presenting it actually in class is optional. So if, you, if you'd rather, if you would rather, you can just um, show it to me like personally like either in office hours or um, you know or offline somehow you could also even do it online if you want um, you know if it's if it's something that's easier viewed online uh, but the point is everyone should make something and then the three to five minute you know for, for everyone who wants to show something in class will will uh, reserve the uh, class for it and last year it uh, we were able to devote half a class to to this and then I was able to actually continue with more material in the second half so we'll see like hopefully hopefully something like that can actually fit into and, and give us a little bit more time to to start something else and uh, you're welcome to use any of these tools uh, or even go off the board with something that we haven't shown if you want um, so the ML for ML5 um, and ML for a demos uh, in JavaScript, those are, you know, that's going to be super relevant. Obviously, there's a lot of ML5 activity here, so that's a good thing to use. If you want to use the open framework stuff that I'll show today, that's also um, available. And then uh, Weaponator is an option. Runway, these are all, you know, great tools to, to use. And um, you can go off the board and, you know, find something really awesome on GitHub and just bring it here. Totally, totally cool. Um, as long as it has some machine learning in it, then it's relevant to the class. And even if it doesn't have machine learning in it, it's still cool. So, um, <laughs> just, you know, show me, show me something in the spirit of the class. Um, and then I'll, I'll really quickly, just, just so you kind of know where we're headed, the next five weeks look roughly like this. Um, today we're going to do some, um, today we're going to do some more applications and feature extraction some runway and Wakanator examples. Terminal velocity will be on Friday. And then next week we're gonna get into like stuff like uh, generative art stuff. So basically looking at things like deep dream and style transfer and kind of making art with neural networks, uh, pre-generative models. So these will be techniques that, that um, are technically not what are called generative models. Generative models will actually introduce in October or later, later in October. And then um, we'll, we'll see about the 8th. I think the 8th might be like just overhanging stuff from the last, from the two weeks before that. Um, and also maybe just like tying up loose ends that might be useful to you for the midterm presentations. And then uh, we'll be, so we'll see about the 8th. It'll be, it's a little bit of a wild card. And then on the 15th, uh, we have no class. 
So that's just something to be aware of. That's a Monday schedule. So you, you do have class, it's just your own Monday schedule. And then uh, the 22nd, uh, I should mention again, like I said, I'll be out of town between the 8th and the 22nd. So I won't have office hours uh, in person. So if you want to meet, like meet before then or, um, you know, digital. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and then the 22nd, uh, we'll do our mini presentations. I'm going to throw on some, some 3D glasses and eat popcorn and you guys take over. So, um, and then depending on how much time we'll have, we'll, we'll um, get into the next sort of segment of the class, which is basically generative models. So GANs and, and um, you know autoencoders and and RNNs and all that kind of stuff like deep learning deep learning generative model stuff uh, and that will be basically the stuff that that mostly characterizes the next the the three to four weeks after that and then after that we have like three weeks left something like that in the in December which we'll use for sort of miscellaneous things that don't fit the other two segments um, maybe we'll talk about some audio stuff possibly, some natural language processing stuff, reinforcement learning, those are all kind of stuff that I brought in towards the end of last last uh, class. So that will probably be kind of where we go. Um, okay, are there any any questions? Uh, that was a long sort of admin admin stuff. Any, any questions? Okay, cool. Okay, so um, I'm going to now, uh, let me just kind of see, oh, oops. Uh, I want to show you basically like the rest of today, I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of review a little bit of what we learned the last two weeks about neural networks and uh, talk a little bit about feature extraction. I'm just trying to get a sense of how much. Um, and then that will take us into some demos uh, for data visualization demos, like uh, which will kind of be a nice lead into to ML query OFX. So basically, so yeah, let's kind of do that. Um, the this slide seems kind of out of order, actually. Um, hold on a second. Yeah, this this slide does seem out of order. So let me let me quickly just move this to where it makes more sense. Uh, whoop. Okay, so um, the idea is this, um, and we, we kind of touched upon this towards the end of last week. So neural networks, you know, a train, let's say you train a neural network to do image classification, that you have 10 categories of images or 100 categories of images and you train a neural network to be able to classify them. So what's really going on is that the neural network is learning a way of representing data points as feature vectors. Um, feature vectors being vectors of statistics about the image, which you know characterize that image in a way that's useful for the task that it was trained to do, like classification. Um, and so, you know, remember we we showed uh, Covnet Viewer where I would have the um, camera pointing at me and it was constantly classifying everything but before the um, last layer would give us the classification we saw something like this where the the um, you would get this this um, vector of cells where the cells are all these the values of different features as we call them to the network and you know we don't know what it's hard to interpret each of them, but we saw that some of these might uh, light up for faces, or some of them might light up for windows, or you know, light up for text, or you know, all sorts of all sorts of high-level characteristics of images, right? So this this every image has a feature vector associated with it, and. Um, the idea is that the feature vector characterizes the image, and so an image that is similar 
a similar image to this, let's say an image that of another car, should kill, should produce a feature vector which is also similar. In other words, it would be highly correlated with this one. It would look, you know, similar. Maybe maybe almost the same. Yeah. Are those pixels the pixels from the image above? No, um, they're um, they're activations in the in the layer of the neural network. They show the activity of of in this case, 4,096 neurons, and each of those neurons are indicating the presence of some high-level feature, like like the presence of a face or the presence of a of text, you know, something like that. Mm -hmm. And some of them are are not easy to interpret. You know, like when I say text or face, that's me sort of um, characterizing it later. You know, based on my perception of it but um, it may be some statistical artifact basically but the point is that two images that have similar content will have similar features um, in other words the distance between each of their feature vectors should be small or the correlation between them should be high um, and um, the, the, and so if you think of it this way then let's say we have a database of 10 million images just for sake of argument we can grab all of their feature vectors and then you and then these feature vectors the feature vector this one is 4096 numbers so the way you can think of that is that there's a 4096 dimensional space and every image is a point in that 4096 dimensional space right does that make sense the, there's 4096 numbers here and so they're all continuous, you know, some, some bound, some bounded, um, you know, some bounding box. And each, every possible image would be a point in that space. Um, and the images we have in particular are a set of points in that space. So we, sometimes you'll hear this called an embedding. Um, embedding means taking a bunch of points and embedding them inside of a space, right? So, um, and the embeddings, um, so the, these are all roughly synonymous with each other. Embeddings, feature vectors, um, you know, encodings, these are all sort of like roughly synonymous. And um, the embeddings give us a lot of information about the relationships between the data points. In this case, our data points are images. So, um, you know, so or at least in the last example, they're images. The um, the the relationships uh, can be uh, sort of characterized by a few different uh, operations. So, if two images are very similar to each other, their embeddings will be very close to each other. So, like for example, B and E are very close to each other, and so they should be they should be roughly similar the uh, but but what's he, so the magnitude of the vectors between them is important because if it has a low magnitude if it's small then that means those two points are similar uh, but also the direction is is meaningful as well um, which is which is really cool and that's something that we'll kind of see a little bit more later today when I show word to vec I think that's in a few slides um, the direction is kind of like a, a a feature change. So if you go from B to E, you know, there might be some sort of a changing of the features that takes you from B to E. And so there might be something that has a similar direction from A, which has the same, it's really hard to explain. This will make more sense when we, when we show the example of word vectors. Uh, some of you are probably already familiar with that maybe. Um, so, so forget the whole direction thing for just a few slides and I'll get back to it. Um, so yeah, now, uh, so yeah, like, so okay, so in this example, B is closer to E than to C. So that means that B and E are probably similar, um, and you know, B and C are not so similar. And this is kind of useful for retrieval, because sometimes we might ask a question, what is the most similar thing we have to B? And so the most similar would be the one that whose embedding is the closest. Um, now, yeah, the vector between A and C is similar to the vector between B and D, so that might that might confer a relationship. We'll, we'll kind of see that in a few slides. 
recall that neural networks are a way for us to actually get embeddings. So there's a lot of ways of getting embeddings, but a really good way is to train a neural network to give them for you. And um, they may do so as an artifact of being trained for a specific task. So the task of you know, image classification, for example. And we saw that neural networks, they take in some input, like in this case, an image of pixels, and it will project it through a bunch of neurons whose weights have been optimized to perform the task uh, that we trained it to do, like image classification. Um, and then, you know, the embedding that we use might be this right here, the middle layer. So that's a useful, um, we would pull the values out of these neurons here, and that could be our embedding. And actually, technically, you could use the classification itself as the embedding also. That's even more high level. Uh, but you'll see very much in in machine learning, this tends not to be done because the classification layer might be a little bit too specific for the task that it was trained to do. And we're kind of interested in more general sort of uh, feature vectors. So it's useful to kind of pull out one of the previous layers. Um, we talked about gradient, we talked about how neural networks are trained. So the, the dominant way of, of training is using a technique called gradient descent, which is a multivariable optimization technique, which is broadly useful in machine learning and lots and lots of other fields. So gradient descent is a really awesome thing to understand. And it's, it's easy enough to, to understand if you have a little bit of background on some of the, the basics. Yeah. Oh, did you have a question? Well, I was thinking about this gradient descent, and I kind of understand the technique of it, of like finding the minimum of the graph and the species you take. From here to like something that's suitable for us, like what, how what the what does the minimum represent in in the world with like I don't know if you will. What's the use of gradient descent for 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 you? What was the question? Yeah, like from from that finding the minimum spot, like yeah, mm -hmm. like from there to giving us what incremental. Well, um, you don't need to implement it usually because most of the most of the uh, software we're using has already implemented it. Gradient descent is just a technique that's used to train the neural networks. So we use it all the time. Like for every, all of the demos that we showed last week, like for example, when we did the camera image thing, they were using a camera classifier where we gave it a whole bunch of examples of, you know, my face and then a whole bunch of examples of my hand then we, we trained it, it used gradient descent to train. Okay, so that's what I'm saying with the gradient descent and that minimum that, that was found is kind of correlate to recognizing the face or recognizing the wall. Or... Yeah, um, we try to minimize the error of our neural network, the loss of the neural network. And if we minimize it, then the neural network tends to do better at the task. Okay, so we sometimes get the uh, result like, okay, so that's 76% uh, probability of a wall. Yeah. So that's like uh, minimum with uh, the error. Uh, the, the, um, the error just represents like how bad it is at giving us those probabilities. So if it says 76% dog, but it's a cat, then it should have a high error. Um, so we're trying to minimize the error. Mm -hmm. okay. um, we talked about like got into some more like of the lower level detail stuff that that probably won't is is a little bit probably beyond the scope of this class, but is interesting anyway. Um, so things like just so you're a little bit literate with the uh, terminology that might come up if you start to investigate this stuff a little bit deeper after this class you'll hear things about different optimizers, different uh, regularization techniques and things like that. And those are all things that are mostly beyond the scope of this class. They're, they're probably more relevant to people that are studying uh, machine learning in the more scientific context. Uh, but researchers talk about this stuff all the time. And if you end up you know, engaging with this field enough to kind of like read the abstracts of papers, let's say, you'll, you'll you'll probably want to be familiar with some of these, you know, sort of basic, um, basic terminology. 
Uh, we talked about how when you train a neural network, it gives you a, a representation, then you can actually visualize uh, the representation so you can find out what the weights do. So we saw in the one layer neural network, the weights are learning features, right? So you can see these features coming out in the one layer neural network, the features are the classes themselves because it doesn't have any, it has to go straight to the classification in one layer. Um, and then in two layer neural networks, you might see something a little bit more abstract. We did this demo with the CovNet viewer, the, um, which I'll show again later today, probably, um, which showed how um, the image is repeatedly, t uh, like we repeatedly derive a higher and higher level um, representation of the image. And by higher level, I mean the features go from things like edges and corners to things like objects and object categories and shapes and things like that. Like so, so a higher level representation. Covenant Viewer does a nice job sort of illustrating that. Um, and so because of that, we can do calculations like the following. So here's a question. How similar are the two images at the top? And how similar are the two images at the bottom? Um, so unless anyone's going to protest, I will, I will say that the Image, uh, image of the cat and the dog are more similar than the image of the cat and the car, right? Um, well, how do we know that? Is that something we can actually quantify? And it turns out it is something we can quantify because what we can do is we can train a neural network to do image classification so that it finds dogs and cats and cars. And then we can use the net network to extract the feature vector from it. And then we would just do a simple distance calculation between them. Right, and that's one way of doing it, but there's others as well, like correlation. But the idea that Im is that images with similar content have similar activations in the high layers. Um, so, you know, like the cat, the, these two feature vectors, the one associated with the cat and the one associated with the dog, it obviously it's like really difficult for you to see, but these two are more alike than than either of them are with this one. Now that's really hard to see from this from this visualization, um, but it's it's actually true. Um, and you you would if you could yeah. In that visualization, which part is the high layers? Like the top of the rectangle or? The it, um, in in the oh no 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 the high layers I mean uh, high level I mean, I mean which is the later layers like this is a high le uh, yeah. high level, low level, high level. I know it's left to right, but. High level, they, it's a computer science abstraction goes. Low level is sort of like low information data. And uh, high means, you know, more, um, more levels of abstraction. And so that's kind of what's happening in a neural network. It's, it's acquiring levels of abstraction as you go through the layers. So I was just curious, like, the next the visual representation of that, like, yeah, this is this would be the feature vector, which is going to be one layer in the network, which is probably the, la the second to last layer. Um, now, uh, now one thing is that, um, and th this is a little bit of math for you. So these four thousand ninety six bit vectors, um, they are you know they they do have these relationships that I just mentioned but they tend to not do a very good job by themselves because they're kind of redundant so a lot of uh, they're kind of self-similar there's a lot of core like a lot of the a lot of these uh, cells are going to be highly correlated like when one is up the other is up and so usually um, instead of using the raw feature vector we will usually try to reduce its dimensionality with a, a dimensionality reduction technique. And we're gonna talk about a few of those now, um, or in, in a few slides. But um, for those, um, so how many of you have, are familiar with this idea of dimensionality reduction? All right, okay. Um, the idea of dimensionality reduction is that, let's say you're dealing with high dimensional vectors. So 4,000 is pretty high, 3,000 is pretty high. Um, we would like to take this data set, which is in 4,000 dimensions, and reduce it down to a manageable number of dimensions, let's say 200 or 300, 
but keep all of the as much as we can keep all of the um, sort of um, keep the in the structure of the data set roughly intact so that when we reduce the dimensionality if point A and point B are close and point A and point C are far we'd like to reduce the dimensionality in such a way that after we reduce it point A and point B are still close and point A and point C are, are far and dimensionality reduction just means compression kind of right it's that's what compression does as well so compression when you reduce an image into a JPEG it's trying to find a small a, a small uh, representation like a low dimensionality like a low dimensionality representation which um, maintains or saves as much of the original information as possible and of course it's not possible to to reduce it without losing some information um, or at least it's not possible to reduce it a lot and and um, maintain uh, maintain the original information but um, it is useful to sometimes trade some uh, representational power for dimensionality reduction because for many reasons one is that the vectors are easier to deal with they're just smaller so if you use them in operations they compute faster they take less storage space uh, but also it's necessary because if you do distance calculations between between among these three you'll see that they turn out to be not super meaningful because there's a lot of redundancy and so sometimes like a particular underlying statistic is responsible for 10 or 20 or 30 of the of the uh, cells here and so if there's 10 or 20 30 cells that are saying the same thing then they're overweighted in the distance calculation so it's not very good it uh, there's a principle in in sort of like um, in machine learning that high dimensional space is is um, is sort of um, not good not not good we don't want high dimensional space because um, well there's a lot of really weird properties of high dimensional space that you learn about if you're if you study machine learning at a more theoretical level so for example um, let's let's use this uh, Clementine as an example or is it an orange it's a Clementine. Um, so here's a cool question this is a sphere right I mean it's not exactly a sphere but imagine it's a sphere how much of the volume of this sphere is contained inside the peel? So like, we could just guess, like it's probably 10%, I don't know, 5%, right, of the volume inside the sphere is inside the peel. Because the peel is about this thick, let's say. So, you know, you could just guess 5, 10%, something like that, right? Um, now, a sphere is just a three-dimensional circle, right? A circle, in two, if this were a circle, we could ask the same question, you know, how much of the volume or area in that case is inside the peel, and it would be 5 10%, right? But now, let's say instead of having it in three dimensions, it was inside of 10 dimensions, let's say. So we have a hypersphere. A hypersphere is a, is a shape which is the ana analogous to a, a sphere, except in many dimensions, right? Like, what is a sphere? It's the set of all points that are equidistant from a circle, uh, from, from a point. So you could do that in any number of dimensions. You could have a hypersphere. So if you have a hypersphere, then you could ask the same question. How much of the volume is inside the peel? And, uh, the you know, the hyperpeel. <laughs> um, and... Um, it turns out that you can calculate this. There's ways of you can. It's a, actually a simple calculation because there's a formula for what the volume of any of any hypersphere would be in with respect to its dimension. And if you do that calculation, you'll see that the volume of the peel in ten dimensions is going to be a lot higher. It'll be like let's say it's eighty percent. And if you go to a hundred dimensions, then the volume of the peel is like ninety nine point nine percent of the volume of the whole sphere. In other words, like almost all of the volume is in the tiny, tiny shell on the outside. So basically like 
as you go away from the center of the space, you get into like what appears to be a really, really vast volume of nothingness. Um, so it's kind of, I mean, I don't know, like that's a, a nice little mathematical, um, you know, oddity, one of those counterintuitive facts. Um, but it has, it has serious complications for machine learning because in machine learning, to understand the data set, we need to have enough information about the, about the, um, you know, about the volume in which the data is embedded in. And if that volume is mostly empty space, then it's very hard to make generalizations that work well. And so basically this is what's, this is a reference to what's called in machine learning, the curse of dimensionality, right? So, and you can actually read about the curse of dimensionality. It's been understood for a few decades. The idea is that if your data is represented in too many dimensions, then you, then um, it actually doesn't work for, for most things. Um, the funny, funny enough, the deep learning seems to actually like has maybe overcome the <laughs> issue of um, of uh, the curse of dimensionality, but 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 really by reducing its dimensionality. So I guess it hasn't really overcome it exactly. It's just kind of mitigated it. But anyway, like I'm going into too many details. The point is, dimensionality reduction gives us useful feature vectors, um, and we'll end up using it. Was there a question? Yeah. Um, so this uh, kind of long. Uh, rectangle that represents the activation. Yep. Uh, is there a name for that? Like, is that generated after like a model is created and then you put one of the outputs, or is this just kind of like a diagram to represent the vector? Yeah, this is just the diagram that I made to represent it. All it is is it's just like this. Oh, I see. It's the values inside of these, okay. and the reason why it's a rectangle isn't because it's there's actually a rectangle. It's really just a row of numbers. But uh, that row of numbers would be this thin and 4,096 cells wide, and so I just made it into a rectangle. So you could read it like a book. Um, yeah, just a visualization. Mm -hmm. So when you're doing dimensionality reduction, is there any sort of like averaging of similar vectors, or are you literally just dropping a set of vectors that's been like determined to be redundant? Um, so uh, we'll, we'll get into that, but the short answer is you use a dimensionality reduction technique like principal component analysis, which actually we'll, we'll, we'll describe that in a minute. Um, but any, in any case, that's what we do with transfer learning, generally speaking. We usually try to reduce the dimensionality. Um, okay, so images embedded in feature space. Okay, you can kind of see the two dogs will be, will be near each other and the cat will be close, reasonably close to the dogs and the car and the house are far away. Uh, these probably aren't the best images to use because for example, we should see a relationship preserved between this, these, these two and these two, like the same relationship, but, but it's not, it's kind of random. So, but, but the idea is similar images, similar embeddings. So we can use that for a technique called reverse image search. So when you go to Google images, you can upload an image and then Google will show you the images that are most um, similar to that image that it found on the web, right? Um, everyone see that feature before, right? You can kind of, uh, um, there's a really nice art project made by, made by this artist I know named Dries De Porter. I think uh, quite a long time ago. Let's see if I can find it. Uh, where he basically did like a feedback loop of Google of reverse image search. So, um, let's see if I can find this. I don't remember what it was called, but no, <laughs> that's something else, I guess. Like, I think it's, let's see if we can find it. Oh yeah, this is, it's actually, he, he's a very clever artist. Like he made this application that's like a die with me. Like, do you, does anyone know this app? It's a great ITP style app, I think. Basically it's a chat room that you can only have access to on your phone when, when your phone has like 5% battery. <laughs> so <laughs> it's really nice, but let's see if I can, you know, I, I don't know if I'll, was it, was it actually, was it him who made it or maybe it was somebody else? Maybe I'm, I might be confusing it like, 
Um, Oh, well, um, is it this? Man, I, I can't remember anymore. This is a, cause this, no, no deep dream. This, it was a while ago project. I'll have to find it and look it up. I'll try to send it to you guys if I find it. I might be, maybe it wasn't Bruce who made it. I think I thought it was him though, but anyway. Um, okay, anyway, anyhow. Uh, now, the thing is, embeddings work with other things. You can also embed sounds, right? So, um, embed words. So, maybe some of you might be familiar with the word to vec. You might have heard of this. This is what word to vec means. It's just embedding words in a feature space. So, this is kind of, this is where the relationship vectors kind of come into play. So, with words, right, it's not just that you know, queen, duke, and king are more similar to each other because they're words of royalty, so that you'll find that they have similar vectors, but also the, re the vectors between them, the relationship vectors are preserved. So woman to queen is the same as man to king, right? Queen to king is the same as woman to man. So you'll see that there's this like, there's a gender vector inside of this. Uh, there's also a, like, okay, there's a, 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 ge a gendering vector, but also there's a, um, royal let's go like a royalty vector like woman to queen man to king so there's a this uh, okay so who wants to guess where duchess would be where would duchess be i know you can't really point to it but yeah exactly it, it, yeah i'll assume that you yeah duchess would be there um and uh you'll see in word to vect like there's all sorts of relationships that are preserved in the in the um the the sort of um direction between words so so okay male female there's also verb tense so you know walking walked there's even things that are like country capital you'll see there's a country capital vector inside of a, a word to vect space now this looks like it's in three dimensions but really word vectors will have a few hundred dimensions typically maybe even a few thousand uh, depending depending on various things, usually a few hundred. Um, and in principle, you could maybe do that. You you can also do this with not just words, but entire phrases or sentences or texts. Um, basically, anything that can re re be represented uh, statistically, we can embed in some sort of a feature space. So okay, like there could be a question inversion vector. So the hardware store is in Queens. Where is the hardware store? The mouse ate the cheese. What did the mouse eat? You see that the relationship between these two pairs of sentences is the same. Um, so one of my students last year, um, Itai, so some of you may know Itai. I guess he just graduated. <laughs> um, Itai kind of used this to great effect. He did this, uh, he used the sentence encoder, which is something we'll see probably later this year, um, to embed basically like uh, fairy tales and stuff in um, you know in some sort of a feature space and then use that to sort of tell these artificial fairy tales kind of um, it's a nice little project if you look up his website I think I, I think he has it online um, and then st things like this start to make a little bit more sense so maybe uh, we can actually show this later maybe we'll show this in attention we'll show attention again in runway so uh, attention again is this generative model. We'll talk about generative models later in the semester, but it's a generative model whose input is a sentence embedding. So you go, okay, a woman is eating a delicious sandwich, and that gets encoded into some embedded sentence, and then that becomes the input to a neural network, and that neural network produces an image of a very clearly a woman eating a delicious sandwich. <laughs> and that's just, and yeah, what's underneath F? It's a neural network, except one with a lot more neurons than this one, but nevertheless a neural network. Um, then, uh, so just other examples of, of um, how does this work, hierarchical storage generation? Oh, um, I'm not sure why this is relevant here. This is probably more relevant to the NLP section, but okay, maybe, maybe people will find this interesting. This, you can use this to generate stories as well, because you can generate, once you, 
can um, embed language into a feature vector, then uh, you can actually use neural networks to produce text. Um, and this, this is all kind of all related. We'll, we'll have a section on NLP most likely. It might just be a lecture, like probably late in the year. Last year, we only had time to just do it, do it as a lecture, unfortunately. Maybe we'll do more of it depending on what people's interests are, but I'll probably revisit this uh, later in the year. Um, okay, so, okay, now let, let's just see, so it's 4, it's 4.22, we have half, the class uh, reaches its halfway point at like 4.40, let's say I have 10 minutes, so how about this, like I'm going to, um, I want to tell you a little bit about principal component analysis, and that will take us to, yeah, this is actually okay. So I'm going to actually attempt to finish the slides even, and then we'll take a break and then it might be like a long first half and then we'll, we'll, re well, well, let's just, let's just get into it and we'll see how far we get. Um, basically we're getting close to, to TSNI, which is going to be the first, I think probably the first um, thing that we try to do practically today. So um, first of all, how does this work? How do we go from this to this while trying to maintain all the information? So how many of you are familiar with principal component analysis? At least one person, two people. Um, PCA is, although it sounds very um, sort of uh, intimidating, it's actually a relatively simple technique that's been around for like 100 years or something like 150 years maybe. 200 years, I don't know what it is, but basically the idea is that we want to be able to take a data set in some number of dimensions and re-represent it in a smaller number of dimensions while maintaining the integrity of the data set. And by maintaining the integrity, I mean by, by not corrupting the values, uh, by corrupting the values as little as possible so that the relationships between the points are roughly preserved. Um, so it's compression, right? So for example, this the, what you're looking at in this picture, let's say we have this data set, which is given to us by these, the points, the pluses, squares, X's, and O's. Um, for the purposes of this visualization, um, I, I just took this from the internet. Uh, we don't care about the classes, just assume these are all points. Doesn't matter that it's a circle, X, whatever, they're just all points. So imagine you have all these points and they're in a three-dimensional space. But then you're looking at it and it seems like all of the points lie very close to a plane that cuts through the three-dimensional space, right? So you see there's a three-dimensional space here and there's all these points in 3D, but really they're all very close to a flat plane that's inside of that three-dimensional space. So what we could do is we could find that plane and then we can sort of pull it out and make it a new representation of the points, which is in 2D, which is where they are in the plane. Now this is useful because it takes our data and it gives it to us, it, it takes it out of 3D and puts it into 2D. And so there's less numbers. Um, and not only are there less numbers, but they're, the points are now much dense, more densely packed in our space. So our space is more familiar to us because we have points in all of it instead of big regions of emptiness. And, um, and the points themselves, now of course like, like to we have to project all these points onto the plane. So a, a, a lot of them may be on the plane, but some of them might be a little bit, you know, like a little bit off the plane. And so when we flatten them, when we project them all down, we are corrupting the data a little bit, right? Um, and the idea of principal component analysis is that this can be actually done using a matrix multiplication and it can also be undone, so it's invertible, right? Because um, how many of you have taken like some matrix math, you remember this idea that you can, um, so in linear algebra you learn how to multiply matrices by each other, so this representation, right, like we have this data set um, X and we can get its, a new representation of it by multiplying it by some matrix W. And then we can take the inversion of W, or rather the, the, um, 
like the yeah we could basically it's just like multiplying by the reciprocal except with matrices so you can then go back but here's the catch once we've gotten rid of a bunch of dimensions we've corrupted the data set so that if we take this and get, get, find this and then we try to go backwards we'll mostly reconstruct it but all of these points will will now have been projected onto that plane and so they won't be in the exact same location that they were previously so this is how um, so this is how a uh, sort of uh, dimensionality reduction technique could work um, and this is one particular kind of dimensionality reduction technique which is called principal component analysis uh, principal component analysis can be used for compression so you could even use it for image compression you know like you can Re, um, uh, represent images as the, with principal component analysis in a smaller way and then and then you can go backward like you're in real time to display the image you would just go back you would multiply back into the original space um, but it would look a little messed up and you PCA generally isn't used for image compression because it's not as good as JPEG which is exactly like optimized for images but you know did you have a question? Yes, except uh, in, with deep learning, we'll use neural networks for this instead of PCA. Um, and the reason, and it'll, and I'll, I'll get why, I'll get to why in, in a moment. Um, yeah. What's the difference between this and the dimensionality reduction? This is a form of dimension. This is a type of dimensionality. Like principal component analysis is a way to do dimensionality reduction. Um, it's also a way of doing other things, but but uh, the way of doing it for dimensionality reduction is that. What principal component analysis does is it gives us a, a vectorization of the original data where, where it, the, it is ordered by the, by, uh, it's like, okay, the idea is you find a orthogonal basis. So it's these basis vectors that form a, like a coordinate set. So like, a, for example, a plane, right? Or a, or a, um, you know, a cube within the higher dimensional space you find the right one such that it captures all of the data and then you can order all of those all of the new points you can order them according to the the vector which has the most variance and the most variance means it has the most it has the most influence on the or it, it's basically the um, captures most of the difference between the points so you order it by the variance of the vectors and then you drop all of the ones that aren't that have a low variance and this is yeah so i mean maybe this is tmi it's not a math class but it's all super super relevant we had one math person here right who, who was the math someone took the oh you yeah, yeah okay so you this is all so you so you 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 get all this but everyone else like it's 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 all interesting stuff i highly encourage you to like take some linear algebra and you know anyway um, so what else can you do you could do reverse image search you can also do things like shortest path between images so maybe if, if some of you are paying some attention to the machine learning sort of art world two years ago Mario Klingemann a good uh, uh, like a big artist in the space he had this um, online um, he, he did this online uh, project for I forgot who for, but basically like he had a collection of museum images. And so the idea here is that you let a user pick two of the images and then it will, um, and then it will find the, sh find the path through other images uh, between those two endpoints. So, okay, you pick a motorcycle and a vase. Here's the vase and here's the motorcycle. Let's go from the vase to the motorcycle. Right? Or how about from the scorpion to an alligator, to a ship? Um, here's a nice one. So how do we go from a piano to a motorcycle? So from piano to another piano, to a chair, to a, to a chair with wheels, to a wheelchair, to a motorcycle. Right. That's rad. 
Oh, I like this one. From a yin yang to a panda bear through a soccer ball. Yeah, all good stuff. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So are you thinking of like like those GANs that produce faces? So that's different because that those are actually being generated. Um, these are actual images from a data set, right? So this is a little slightly different because we're we're um, we're not actually we don't have a generative model here. We just have a bunch of images from a data set that we've put inside of a space. But there's no relationship between those two. It's not that there's no relationship. I mean, they're also, you know, all of those are also represented in some, in some feature space. Um, but it's, it's uh, certainly different because these are, um, I, this is from an actual data set. And there's no generative model. Okay. Yeah? But could we, could we um, visualize the transition period between the two? Uh, sorry, a what? Could we visualize the transition between the two? Not with this, because there's no generative model. There's just a bunch of images inside. We don't have a... Um, like, we would have to train a generative model to produce new images if we wanted to do that. Yeah. Um, now, um, so how would something like this work? So you, all of these images are embedded inside of a space, and then we want to go from... We want to take the shortest path between two points. Now, of course, the shortest path between two points would just be the line between them, right? Now, that would be kind of boring, right? So uh, with this, what you do is all of the points are embedded in a space, and then uh, you create a graph. And a, a graph is uh, this, uh, this kind of a data structure where some points are connected by vertices and others are not. And the graph would... would um, Point, uh, the points would only be connected if the distance between them was less than some threshold. And so you basically have all these images embedded in the space, and then you only have connections between images if they're close enough to each other. And so then given two endpoints which are not connected to each other, what's the shortest path through the graph that you can go to to find the, uh, to go from one endpoint to the other? And that's how, that's how this works. And oh yeah, so this is this was Mario's um, uh, work. We can actually look at it online. It should still be working. Um, let's see. So then it lets you pick. It's like okay, I'll pick um, this. And this. Some of them are really nice. Um, let's try this. How about... How about... Let's try to take two that are really weird, like two that are really, not weird, but different from each other. So this and, okay, east to west, or, uh, yeah. And it goes through Egypt, amazing, amazing. <laughs> so that's Japan to Egypt to, I don't know what that is, but it's some Madonna, so it's gotta be from Europe, I guess. Um, yeah, we could have a lot of fun with this, but yeah. Um, no, this is um, what this is is it's basically this technique that I just mentioned. So the all of the images are embedded inside of a space, and then we build a graph uh, among them, where images that are close enough to each other are connected by a vertex, and so then at runtime you pick two images. And then it finds the path through the graph, which gives you the smallest, smallest, um, yeah, uh, smallest pa travel path. Yeah. Um, oh, uh, I wrote Kenya. So, so yeah, that's that's another way of 
Okay, so like the graph could be done in two ways. It could be using k nearest neighbors, where every point is connected to its k nearest neighbors, um, or you could take a threshold at a distance. The point, the problem with thresholding at a distance is that you might get orphans, like like basically points that are not connected to. That's what they're called in graph theory, orphans. Um, they're not connected to any others. Uh, so if you use k nearest neighbors, you get rid of that problem. But then maybe you have con uh, some connections that are really long. Maybe that's suboptimal. But you know, there's all sorts of there's all sorts of study on this. I think there's probably a lot of people have studied it much more. And then there's t -SNE. and t -SNE is another dimensionality reduction technique, um, which has um, become pretty popular the last few years. It's only been around for about five years. I think it was invented in 2014 or something like that. And t -SNE stands for T Distributed Stochastic Neighboring Embeddings. So that's really cool. And it was invented by this guy in, in the Netherlands, I think. Um, and I might be wrong about that. He has a very Flemish sounding name, maybe. But any, anyhow. Um, TSNE is like PCA, it's a dimensionality reduction technique. However, it varies from PCA in the, uh, in the way that the dimensionality reduction is calculated. Um, it's, it's an optimization method that actually does it. So, uh, so PCA is not, um, is not actually, um, well, okay, I guess they're both optimization methods in some sense, but TSNE is sort of a stochastic one, so it'll produce a different embedding every time, roughly. And um, however, TSNE has some properties that are a little bit different from PCA. PCA attempts to find the dimensionality reduction which preserves the most information, uh, basically has the least amount of corruption to the original data. Whereas TSNE uh, is sort of doing that also, but it, it, it really tries to minimize the um, the distance between very close points. So basically, TSNE is less concerned about the overall global structure and more concerned about clusters of points being roughly self-similar. Um, so TSNE is not necessarily good for, for um, getting the most, uh, getting the most accurate, let's say, uh, representation, but it's very good for visualization, it turns out. And that's actually what it was invented for. So it does really great at making really nice plots. Um, and we love TSNE because it gives us a way of visualizing high dimensional data. And we're going to see that in a second. Um, and, and actually TSNE is already becoming old, funny enough. Um, there's been a lot of work over the last few years into other kinds of uh, dimension eye reduction techniques that are useful for data visualization that have various properties that may or may make them use, more useful than TSNE. Uh, UMAP is one that I'm familiar with. I think maybe that's from two years ago, which basically also, uh, it, it's faster than TSNE is my understanding. It can work on a lot more points. TSNE is, it can be a little bit of a pain to calculate on a large set of points, and it's not super fast. But, you know, to each their own. We already have implementations of TSNE, so it's kind of easy enough for us to use. Um, now, one thing with TSNE is that uh, if you were to take a million images and run them all through, uh, run them all through a feature feature extractor that gives you, let's say, a four thousand ninety six bit feature vector, and then you try to run TSNE on them, you would find that it would take like four hundred years for it to calculate TSNE, and it may and it may run out of memory too. So, what's very typically done is to take the feature the features that you get, and then first use PCA to reduce the 4,096 bit feature vectors down to something like 300, let's say. Because um, if you still have a few hundred uh, feature vector, a uh, few hundred dimensions, you can, you can really do that without compromising too much on the original uh, data. But then 300, dimensional, 300 dimensions are a lot easier to run through TSNE than 4,096. So. It's very typically you'll see PCA used first, it saves some memory, and it saves a lot of speed. And then TSNE, because PCA is very fast um, and, and can work on, on really large uh, vectors. 
So, um, so now one thing I, I want to, let, let's just see really quickly, um, it's 4.45, so there's a few slides about resources and then we're going to get into TSNE basically. So, um, yeah, let's actually, let's pause right there. We'll take a break and then when we come back, we're going to show how to do TSNE. So if uh, make sure that the whole setup thing completed for you. So please, uh, so once once we, we can actually get back to using that once we're done. Okay, let's uh, pause there. So now what we're gonna do, so we kind of talked a lot about this idea of feature vectors and uh, relations between feature vectors. And really it, it kind of follows from the applications that we've shown the last two weeks. You know, all of these were basically applications of feature um, feature extraction and what I'm going to do now is I'm going to show you um, a couple of things in uh, ML for AOFX and then I'm actually I'll show you the guides later probably we won't actually do the guides but I'll, I'll just kind of like at least show you them uh, what, what you can do with them and also um, yeah so let's talk about TSNI I want to show you guys how to do a TSNI and hopefully this is going to work uh, this is always fun. Um, we'll, uh, so this is, a t this is an example of a TSNI of a bunch of images of animals. So you can see that all of the monkeys have been put together and all of the sort of plant life is around here in this cluster. So that's the idea of TSNI. It gives us a, a layout of, uh, of images or sounds or whatever such that similar sounds or images are grouped near to each other. So it gives us a two-dimensional embedding of these images, which, you know, each of which are represented by millions of pixels potentially. And so it gives us a two-dimensional layout such that similar images, and similar in terms of their content, not just in terms of superficial things like the tint of the image or the color or whatever, but in terms of the content of the image, um, uh, are grouped together and so that's kind of the idea um, and then another thing that's kind of worth noting you know a lot of the, uh, these slides have been around for a while and some of the software is quite old actually raster ferry like it's probably still compiling i i have it inside but uh, raster is this really nice software by mario klingerman which basically does a um, takes a tsni embedding which is in 2d and then uh, assigns it to a grid embedding so it basically takes, it finds the optimal grid layout of these. And I actually have this worked into the software as well. So we'll, we'll see that in a moment. Um, and uh, there's one by Kyle McDonald also, but I for some reason don't have the slide for it. But Kyle also has something called, uh, for open frameworks called um, OFX assignment, which is actually uh, inside the open framework stuff that I'll show you. Okay, so then, um, so this is an example of a gridded TSNI. So if this is the original image TSNI of animals, this is the one where it's been laid out according to a grid, right? So all of the whales are near each other, you know, all of the elephants, raccoons, and so on. So this is kind of a nice, nice feature. Um, lots of people have applied this to different things. You know, I actually have the original, I should pull out the original image of this, yeah. So a student of uh, Golan Levins made a, a gridded TSNI of IKEA uh, furniture, or like it's basically an IKEA uh, brochure, you know, the, all of the products. So if you can get your hands on a nice data set like this, then it's pretty, it's pretty neat thing to, to kind of organize it this way. That's great, right? So the steps for this is images, extract feature vectors, do a PCA, do a TSNI on the results of the PCA, and then do a gridding, do a grid uh, embedding of the TSNI. So it's actually multiple steps, but it's all sort of encapsulated. So that's kind of cool, right? This is really nice, I always like to point this out. Let me also quickly delete this because now that we, this, I've never had this in my, in my class where I'm rendering one video while recording another. 
let's just make sure that um, it came out nicely. Um, I'm gonna remove this from the. <laughs> I just double before I delete the thing. This is what we'll be posting online. Dimensions. <laughs> the undone. So it's invertible. Okay, Red that looks fine, right? Not too yeah. pixelated. Should do. Okay, cool. This is the map. So let me just quickly get out of the. Delete this guy. Oh, actually, it'll. Okay, this is this is fine. Sorry, I'm I'm confusing myself and and all of you. We'll we'll delete that from the. Okay, so anyway, the TCD layout. Um, this is a cool one. Impressionist paintings. Uh, I I don't have I ha I think I have the. Yes, but you, it would be better to use PCA for that rather, or, or, or not even PCA, I mean something like PCA or, or other techniques like autoencoders or something like that. Not TSNI because TSNI does not necessarily, uh, sacrifices sort of some of the integrity of the embedding for the sake of getting a nice visualization layout. Of the literal visualization of the image. Yeah, because TSNI doesn't really preserve global relationships, so you might get two clusters that are like like the clusters are they're just kind of clusters and the clusters don't necessarily have that much correspondence with each other as you know as they would with PCA but the thing about PCA is that it, it it's like a sort of if you try this if you try doing visualization PCA it's like a big mash of stuff is like in one place mm -hmm. so it's just not optimized for that um, like on that line though you could theoretically like could you do a like a 3D visualization of these where it's like in a 3D space and it's sort of the same idea. You just remove, you like take one step back and you don't reduce it all the way down to two dimensions and you keep it at three dimensions or something like, but the, I'm, um, so sorry, what, uh, so like, so the, the thing about this is that we reduce it, the, you know, thousands of dimensions down to two so we can present it like this. Could you theoretically reduce it down to three instead? Oh, oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Mm -hmm. Or four. TSNI is good for basically low, super low dimensional for, for, for visualization. Like for something that you're, if you're not planning on visualizing it, it doesn't necessarily have very much usefulness. But um, for, uh, yeah, you could definitely do a 3D layout. People have done that. If you do 3D stuff, then that's a really, that's a really neat thing. Um, in fact, it would be really neat in Open Frameworks too. Are you open Open Frameworks user? Nope. That's the word. Not well, yet. That's okay. We can get the stuff into Unity or something like that. That would be kind of neat. But yeah, 3D, definitely. Um, satellite images, this is by Zach. Um, and then, uh, okay, so imagine if we did this for audio as well. So you could do, um, you know, there's various ways of extracting features from audio. There's sort of classical methods, which are sort of pre-deep learning methods, which use all sorts of uh, features that have been hand designed by audio people, um, things that kind of take the, take the spectrogram and then derive statistics from it, like spectral centroid, um, MFCCs, mel, mel, um, those are mel frequency capstrel coefficients. I used to do this in my former life, all this sort of audio stuff. Um, but nowadays, it's actually a lot of it is just done with with neural networks um, uh, because you know you can think of it almost like an image. You know, there's really there's a sort of um, some sort of a spatial you know relationship here. From if you look at a spectrogram, it's like an image. Um, it's not exactly like an image, but but you basically you can apply a lot of these techniques almost verbatim um, on, on images and audio. And so then we can do an audio TSNI. And actually, I'm not sure if my audio TSNI is working at the moment, but let me really quickly give it a shot. I think I 
audio TC. Does this work? I don't have it. Huh. Maybe this will work. No, because probably because I don't have this anymore, do I? <laughs> yeah. Okay, that's fine. We'll just do a uh, we'll just do a different one later. Okay, fine. the The idea is that you can. Um, oh, you know what I do have though? I have a video of one. So I did a Tisney with uh, from Bohemian of clips from Bohemian Rhapsody. So you know Bohemian Rhapsody, the song by Queen, and the ter name of a terrible movie about them. Well, it was it was kind of nice. The movie had like, did anyone see the movie? It was like super realistic Queen scenes, which are great, but the script was just like unbelievably bad. Anyway. Point is like a is like a one hundred millisecond long uh, clip from that song. Broken down and then placed and the whole process the same thing done for the audio. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that's another thing you can do, and the Audio Tisney viewer um, has instructions for how to do that, which I'll show you uh, through. And then this one, I'll probably we'll probably skip this one because I'll I'll probably end up showing it to you later date. Um, Okay, so we already talked about this. No free demos. You've seen all this stuff. Wackinator. Okay. Yeah. No, no. no I mean, we we uh, you've seen the slides. I mean, just I just want to. I think all of this stuff got shown. Okay, good. So what I'm gonna do now is let's do some demos. Um, let me also make sure that this gets properly deleted, and then. Um, Okay, so next thing is going to be to, uh, I think what I want to do now is show you how to do the image t viewer. So this is going to be the moment of truth. Um, we'll see if, if this opens for you guys. So at least one person is going to have problems, so we can spend a little bit of time correcting them. Um, in, this, in these releases, assuming that you have run the, um, if you, uh, assuming that you have, uh, successfully run the um, setup, then you should be able to go to like image TSNE live. See this image TSNE live, and then instead of double clicking on it, it's better to uh, if you're in a Mac to right click and click open the first time because Mac does this thing where it'll if it's from an untrusted developer, it won't let you double click it the first time. So just you know, um, so click open, and you should see something like this come up. Okay. Did anyone see an error come up instead? Okay, rock and roll. Um, that doesn't mean we're out of the woods just yet. Um, but now what I'd like for you to do is, and you, you may not be able to do this right now, but the idea is we want to do a TSNE of images. So if you have a folder of images that you'd like to do this for, um, so I think, I hopefully I have my animals data set. Um, where is the? Um, we're we're gonna cap it right now at five hundred, uh, just to make sure that um that we like like tried a few hundred is basically. Um, let me just see if I have to find my. I have a data set of animals that I like to. Um, <laughs> where's my animals data set? Uh, 
Oh, Lord, I can't find anything anymore. <laughs> um, oh, this might be kind of... Oh, yeah, this is great. I'll use this data set. I have a data set of landscapes, apparently. And how many do I have? Not that many, but enough that I could do it. 130 items. Okay, fine. So... Um, so find the folder that you want to do this for and you know try uh, let's say like a few let's say at least 100 um, and you know it can be more it can be thousands even but we're gonna we have it uh, capped at 500 right now anyway so it'll just take a random subset of them so basically you see in the menu it says analyze new directory so click on analyze new directory and then find that folder um, where's mine bin data sets landscape small so bin data sets landscape small and then once you're inside that folder just click open and now it's going to you should start to see this loaded blah blah, blah images and then encoded and it starts to encode the images and you'll see this counter now um, who does not see that happening like like if you get a problem let me know where's the data set uh, did you post something or did you just no um yeah yeah just use your Whatever use your vacation image photos you know you're not the one on the projector so <laughs> 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 just kidding uh, all my pictures are wholesome <laughs> actually i have to constantly delete my pictures because they take up too much space in the computer so okay um so let me like while you're doing that i'll just show you what i got i have this you can scroll two finger <coughs> scroll kind of expands them outward and then dragging will let you um let you move around and you can see that like there i'm going to full screen this you can see that they've been arranged by self-similarity so okay like I mean, all of these landscapes actually look pretty similar. <laughs> so, what happens if you have the same image a couple of times? Then it'll probably do, you know, it'll probably it cluster, it but it may not actually. It may end up because a, a TSN is not a perfect technique, but but roughly they should be clustered. Okay, then you could also click View as Grid. That actually doesn't. <laughs> Looks almost random, but but okay. Like I'll 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 do a better one. I'll do my screenshots. I'll do take my screenshot directory. So that's another one you could use. Screenshots is a good one. Um, oh, but I mine are in the desktop. Oh, but I have a. I think it's screenshots are sort of personal. Um, so this I'll, okay, so then run this. Uh, oh, that's it? I thought I had more than that. Well, okay, let's let's see how that comes out. Yeah? yeah? Um, I mean, how many images are there? Maybe 100 might not be enough really to do it because it may not really have a good sort of, okay, so this is just some random photos. So look like this is one of my screenshot directory. It looks pretty decent. I'm not going to zoom in too much though. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I think that's Francis, yeah. You guys know Francis Tsang? He used to teach here, I think. Um, that's him on Skype, I believe. <laughs> um, yeah, well, uh, this makes sense. You know, you kind of get like a bunch of text kind of clustered here. This is a bunch of maps here. It's more colorful screenshots on the right. So that's a neat thing that you could do. So a few more things that you could do with this. Um, if you, so you could toggle whether or not it's gridded. And then if it's not, you could do this kind of, you know, Zooming, zooming in and out. 
two finger skull will kind of co uh, collapse them inward. Um, and then if you want to do an export, you can go to this uh, save, save screenshot and then it will actually save it, uh, save the thing that you just made as, a, as just a PNG. And um, now, now right now if you look at the settings, Analyze is stuck at, uh, th this is the settings that we have for Analyze. So um, you can make the maximum number of images larger. Oh, that's why, it, well, um, I think maybe that's why, it, I think I, let me try this again. So maximum images says, okay, if you have more than this many images in the directory, then it'll just take a random subset of this. So it'll max, it'll cap it at the number of images. Um, really like 8,000 images is getting to be, is, is a lot. Like, and you might, if you, like, it's a little bit untested at super high numbers because you might start to run into memory, memory issues. So um, this is sort of a suboptimal environment because it has to keep everything in memory. So try to scale this up, you know, maybe try it with 2,000, 3,000, 5,000 images. Uh, don't go straight to for the top shelf immediately because you might be waiting for like three hours for it to do all the encodings and then it'll crash. So you want to kind of like get it, uh, uh, see see just how well it can do. Like I never really optimized this very well. But let's see if I, if I do this now. Again, screenshots. There's more than... Yeah, see, I have way more screenshots. So that now it's loading a lot of images. Maybe even too many. But actually, like, that, no, 28 is fine. So what's go, what it's going to do is it's going to now... See, now it's taking a lot of time. This is going to take a long time, probably. Like, I can let it go and then come back and see how it looks. A nice, big, uh, you know, TST. Uh, it'll try to find a rectangular layout, which is most close to a square. So for 28, 19, it'll probably be like... Let's see, it'll probably be like 50 times 40. Uh, let's see, like, uh, it's, like 50, it's like 55 times 55, something like that. So um, we can kind of look forward to that. A few other things to be aware of the settings. You can mostly keep the perplexity and theta as they are. What are perplexity and theta? Perplexity and theta are parameters of TSNI. So TSNI has a few hyper parameters that, that it lets you set that control a little bit how the layout gets made. Um, Basically, perplexity, the best way to interpret perplexity is it's kind of like an estimate of the number of clusters, number of individual clusters that you have. So if you have a feeling that your data set has sort of 50 clusters, it doesn't, I mean, it's a very loose sort of cluster, but, um, but that's kind of the best, you know. If you have 50 types of things in there, then perplexity of 50 is good. The theta parameter is a trade-off between... Um, how accurate and how long it takes. Uh, basically, if you want it to be more accurate, you make theta lower. Although in practice, um, there's a diminishing return. Like if you make theta too low, then it won't be that much more accurate than the theta of whatever, 0 0.3, but it might take way longer to make it. So that's kind of like the trade-off. And um, and let's see, that that's kind of, yeah, that, that's really all the settings here. So the, uh, what's happening here is that it's taking all these images, it's loading them into memory, and I should really be careful about r overrunning memory. I think 28 for me, if I recall, is not so bad. Um, so it should be able to handle this. Um, and then once it's loaded all the images, it, it's going to encode them. So what that means is that there's a pre-trained neural network inside of here, w inside of the application, which uh, will extract the feature vector for each of the images. And so then we'll have a feature vector for all of the images, and then it will calculate a TSNI of them. Um, oh no, am I stuck? All right, sometimes it'll get stuck because you have one big image. Um, it, it, it resizes all the images, so um, yeah. That's kind of, yeah? Yeah, exactly. Uh, and actually, like, if I can't remember, I might not even have that implemented right now. Uh, if you click Save JSON, does it give you? It might come up with a message that says like, "Tell Gene to implement this." <laughs> but I might have actually. Impl I can't remember. Um, it works now, doesn't it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So it gives you a JSON file that has the path 
of it. Uh, well, once you've saved, once you've done the tsnip, it'll give you a, like a list of all the images, the, their path, and um, the both the the tsni point, like between normalized between zero and one, and um, the grid embedding. So yeah, and, and then you can import it into another environment. So this is kind of the easiest way for you for you to make tsnis. There, I have another way that's in uh, one of the ML for A guides, which I'll briefly show you before we before we finish today. Um, so yeah, but this is probably the easiest way if this works for you. Is there is this working for everybody? That did open okay. It's really great because this software is compiled two years ago and still works okay. Yeah. Yeah, um, you know, Mac app. Nice thing about Mac is that applications stay usually pretty usable for over a couple of years. Like in Windows, if you compile one thing, it'll break like five minutes later because they changed the. Uh, sorry, no, no, actually, that's not right. Right, it's the other way around. Windows actually like has crazy backwards compatibility, and then and then Mac breaks their stuff really easily. But but somehow I don't know. Open frameworks tends to be kind of robust. Anyway, um, this is doing its thing, and you can see it's going to take a while um, because now the encoding process, it looks like it's going something like five per second, so this is going to take like, I don't know, 20 minutes maybe. Um, so we can kind of like return to it. So I'm just going to go on to the next thing and uh, let, this, let this run in the background. That'll be a nice test of the My System resources. So I have ScreenFlow <laughs> recording at the same time, the keynote and this encoding thing. Um, so, well, let's see. Yeah. Yeah, except it doesn't do the analysis inside of there. That has to be done in a separate way, uh, which I'm, which I'll actually show you. Um, so maybe we'll do that right now, actually. But the thing about that is that um, it's probably a bad idea to do this right now because the the so um, the and uh, the audio analysis script is a Python script that we would have to run and there's actually some libraries that it has to has to install which which usually when I've tried to do that in the middle of a class it doesn't work for everybody uh, especially because most people won't even have the Python management systems pre-installed so I'm gonna skip that for now and and, and actually just refer you to the instructions um, so so all of these if you I almost pressed escape. That would have been terrible. But okay, it seems to be okay. Um, if you go to mlfray.github.io and then you go to the guides, you'll see that all of these actually, when, and you go to open frameworks, click on open framework, you'll see that all of these have associated guides. Um, so here's the image. Oh, this is just the viewer. Oh, do I not actually have the image TC? Oh, here it is, image TC live. So this has this has exactly what I just showed you. This is the um, this is the instructions how to run this. So you've already more or less can see. Also, there is um, the audio TSNE guide. So audio TSNE viewer. There is a uh, a script that. Um, that you have to install a few libraries. So actually, okay, let's let's actually do a little test. Open a terminal. I want to know how many people, when you r run the command pip, does is pip recognized or does it say pip not found? Command pip. Yeah, pip doesn't come with with Mac, so it's it's just kind of going to be um, a pain right now. Sorry. Uh, there's a, bu a bunch of ways, like um, the best way to install it is to ask Google. <coughs> so this is the way to, this is the easiest way to install it. <coughs> and then run that. Um, yeah, and then, and then we would install some things, but I'm going to, I'm going to save that for now. Either maybe we'll do audio TCN in another week when I maybe um, figure out a better way to package the environment uh, because the old one that I have is, is not updated right now so I have to this would be a bad tree to bark on 
But the point is, for anyone who wants to investigate the audio thing, the instructions are here. And so if you know how to install Python libraries, you can just read the instructions here and, and do it. Yeah. Um, okay, so the next thing that I want to do is, um, okay, so we just, I want to show a few more things from the ML for AOFX collection. And then, um, and then I want to remember what are the things we already looked at Doodle Classifier, right? I kind of, sh did I show Doodle Classifier? Oh, maybe I didn't. I totally didn't, didn't, did I? Okay, I want to show that to you. So let, let me just make a list of the things that I want to show you. Doodle Classifier, uh, Ableton's not going to work for me. I tried that last week, but I, I'm having, I don't have a clip library, so I can't really. Um, who here uses Ableton, anybody? Okay. Huh? Okay. Well, you can definitely, like, um, I showed you how to connect them so that, so that works. I just don't know how to use my Ableton right now without a controller because I don't have any clips. Someone give me a clip library. <laughs> no, you don't have to do it right now, but, but I, I just have a demo version and so I can't even like download them from the Ableton site. I need to, maybe I, I should get sponsorship. Yeah. Them for, I've even spoken at the conference that I don't have sponsorship. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, I think probably because I never asked them. Okay, I also want to show you keyboard OSC. That's a really cool one. And then... Yeah, that'll keep us pretty busy. So I want to show those, and then that should leave us enough time to maybe do a couple like Rodney Wackenator things. Okay, so Doodle Classifier is really awesome. Um, Doodle Classifier, actually, this would be best if I could find a web. Does anyone here out of an external webcam, <coughs> like a USB webcam? No, it's okay. I'll just uh, it's okay. I'll just do it this way. So Doodle Classifier will let us, it's like this paper was given for me, wasn't it? They knew that I would need it. Okay, so Doodle Classifier, I'm gonna open this. I didn't show this, right? Okay, now first of all, everything I'm explaining, you can find in, um, in these, so you'll see Search for Doodle. Here's Doodle Classifier. So I'm just going to describe what this installation does. So actually, like a good thing, let, let me show you first uh, a little video that shows a cool application of Doodle Tune. Um, actually, can I do my audio through the HDMI? Okay. Or maybe it's just going to be. Okay. So first of all, Doodle Classifier was made during a hackathon, um, which is really neat. I made it along with a good friend of mine, Andreas Refsgaard, who, um, so we, we came up with this idea to basically, um, so the, the idea is that Doodle Classifier lets you train the thing to recognize your drawings. And so the idea of the installation was something called Doodle Tunes, where uh, Doodle Classifier was just a generalization of Doodle Tunes. The idea was you would draw musical instruments on the piece of paper, and then they would make Ableton Live play those instruments. There's a piano, put in a little drum set, saxophone. Little bass guitar. So you get the idea. So um, 
doodle classifier is just this, basically. And um, I'm going to show you the idea. So first of all, there's a file. If you look at this file um, inside of data, it says settings doodle classifier.xml. And if you look inside this, you'll see that this is sort of the master settings. Um, it should, oh, yeah. Where uh, the main thing is really this. So basically, if you want, you have a comma separated list of classes, like class names. So th just for the purposes of, of like using this as, as an example, circle, star, arrow, but you can have as many of these and they could be whatever you want to call them. You would just edit this text file and then, uh, and then it, that's what it would have um, here. Circle, arrow, star. So you, that's the way to change your classes. So okay, I want to train it to recognize a bunch of circles, a bunch of arrows and stars. And th this works a lot better when you have like a camera that's kind of overhead pointing down, but I, I don't have like a webcam right, right now, so I'm just gonna do it like the, the, the tricky way. So okay, like circles. So I'm gonna draw a bunch of circles. Oh, this is not working. This is working. It's better. Circle. So I'm going to adjust these uh, computer vision settings. So the ideal is to get these in here. And then maybe do a little bit of, that's not bad. So okay, it's picking up these five. And maybe also Okay, that works decently. So those are my circles. So I'm going to add samples. Okay, so there's some circles. See, it found them. And it's using some computer vision to locate the bounding boxes and then just uh, you know load them, uh, basically pick up the bounding boxes and then get a feature vector for each one. So I'm giving it some circles and maybe I'll give it like some more circles. You don't need that many, but It'll be more robust if you give it some number. So I'm going to turn these on their side. Okay, some more circles. Great. So now I'm going to change this from circle to star. And now I'm going to make some stars. There's a bunch of stars. Okay, so I've got stars selected. So add samples of stars. There's some stars. There's some more stars. Okay, now I'm going to do the final one. We'll do some arrows. Doesn't have to pick up all of them. Bunch of arrows. Oops, got a little bit of a, uh, that happens. It's better when it's down, but that's okay. Um, now I'm going to go ahead and click train. And it trains really fast actually. And so now, it, we can do classification. So basically I can make, like let's put in some, here's an arrow, there's a star, there's a circle, another star, circle. Great. 
Okay, so now I'll go classify. I'll click classify. Oh, let's get the right. Predicted star, predicted star, predicted star, predicted arrow. Screwed it up. Okay, so that one's. Oh, maybe because it sees a little bit of the arrow down there. Yeah, because it's in the back. So that's fine. But okay, mostly mostly correct. If you give it more samples, it'll do a better job, obviously. Star, 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 circle, circle, circle. Not bad. Good. Um, you can also have it run continuously. Yeah. If you have it running, you can also save and load the model. So that's another thing. And then it is being sent. Um, it is being sent over port 8000 with the message classification. So um, you can. Oh, another way to change the settings is actually instead of editing the XML file, you can actually do it like this, but we'll, we'll skip that. So um, what I can do is I can open up. Oh, I already made a. Yeah. So check this out. This I, I pre-made. This, this is in processing. I, I did this just for the purpose of demonstration, so it's quick quick enough. But basically, you can have processing, for example, or anything that uses OSC receive these from Doodle Classifier. So if you look at this, this is really this is really like small code, right? It's just OSC import OSC P5, create a listener on 8000, and then if the address is classification grab each of the thing that it's receiving and then just print that it got that class. So if I run this, so if I go classify, it goes arrow star 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 arrow and look at in processing class got star 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 arrow so it receives it over here so you could do whatever you want with that okay so what would you what are the kinds of things you could do with that you can as we did as Andreas and I did we had a trigger samples in Ableton and the way we were able to do that is by writing it uh, to, to receive OSC code and then when it would receive some OSC code it can send a message to Ableton. There's various ways of communicating with Ableton. You guys know, like you can communicate over OSC if you install some stuff, um, or MIDI is the more supported way. Um, you know, lots of things like that. You could make a generative art sketch. Um, yeah, there's there's tons of tons of cool stuff you can do. Um, any questions on Doodle Classifier? So think about. So the idea usually, like this is really kind of like um, CovNet, you know, or like a feature extractor, but the only thing that it does here is it actually uh, finds, you know, it, you don't, it ha doesn't have to be for drawing actually. I've had students use it for just other things that you put under the camera. Like we kind of intended it for drawing, but that's not really. The point is that it separates s small objects from each other. And so you can have multiple things at the same time in one scene. And so maybe the combination of them produces some sort of an interesting, you know. Um, this is better than the image classifier that we were doing 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 that we finding multiple things in one image instead of just getting a feature extraction for the entire image. So it, last week that was just, you know, was one, um, like the whole image had a classification. But here it's like you can get multiple classifications in one image. It's like a de detection of objects. More like, yeah. Yeah? To, to segment it. So first it, um, uh, basically it is doing a 
create uh, what was it doing? Actually, I'm trying to remember. It's just doing like uh, OpenCV contours, more or less. First, it thresholds the image, and then it gives me um, contours. Yeah, I can't remember what it's. it's Oh, I do, sorry, sorry. Yeah, it's a, it's a brightness threshold. So then that's why you see like white on black and then it's doing contours um, or bounding boxes on those, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and then it also does some other stuff like it's merging squares that are overlapping, stuff like that. Um, but yeah, that's, that's more or less. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Um, okay, so that's Doodle Classifier. I'm gonna show you a few more things. So uh, let's let's have a good order about this. Uh, was there another question? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, let's see if I can get this audio unit OSC thing to work. Okay, so let's let's recall that we have this CovNet predictor thing. Um, oh, let's also check up on that TSNI. Um Yeah, it's done. So can make it bigger. Oh, <laughs> it's a lot of random screenshots. This one you saw. Oh, there I am. A lot of really random stuff in here. I won't go too close. But the, okay, as you know, like you can, you know, export this. Uh, if you want to export it really large, then you would zoom in. Oops. Like basically, it exports at the size that you zoom into. And um, and yeah, this and then yeah, the image size parameter. That's well, okay. So that's control. If it's grid, it's control automatically. my face <laughs> um, so yeah let's yeah so then this you could save the result to JSON and then you could load a JSON so it, assuming that the images don't move locations because it uses uh, absolute path okay back to Cognet predictor let's do this I'm gonna add three sliders and I'm gonna train <coughs> we already showed this last week if I'm not mistaken so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to train like a bunch of examples. So when I hold up this Clementine, I want it to record in these in this configuration. Now I'm going to stop recording and I'll move the slider a little bit to other and uh, let's say for this keys. Now we'll say And it'll be just be like this for and then one other thing I'll do is I'll go down to here. Uh, this, there's no categories here, there's just three sliders. Oh, one slider. Yeah. Um, okay, so now I will train this and start flashing random colors just to, just to let you know it's trying and um, start to predict. Okay, so that's roughly working. Okay, so what can we do with this? So I'm going to open something called Audio Unit OSC. 
And this is only going to be relevant to you if you if you know what audio units. Um, which is this alto yeah I love this thing this is really but I can't remember uh, usually it works with um, it works with different uh, like a MIDI device but there's a few that will give me notes automatically it has some defaults um, let's see if I can oh wait does it not have any where are they convert presets Oh, I don't have presets. No, I can't remember how to make this give me. Ah, uh, no. <laughs> okay, how do I make this make sound? Um, <laughs> okay, maybe right now I won't be able to do this demo like I want to, but because there is a way. Okay, if I make the sequencer, <laughs> who knows how to do audio analog uh, synth stuff? So I make the sequencer go on. Uh, okay, now it's actually moving. And then I need to, there we go. It's making some sound. All right, it's not terribly exciting. Because I don't have presets. There's like some really great presets for this machine. It's good enough to try. So here's what I'm gonna do. I uh, select the pitch parameter, which is gonna be in oscillator complex and now I can actually move it with from there this is gonna sound terrible prob possibly um, what else will That would be a bad idea. Feedback, no. Reverb. <laughs> I'm having a little bit too much fun at your expense, so <laughs> like, um, shape is fine. Let's just select the shape and timbre. Okay, timbre, shape. Let's uh, right, let's give it a shot. So it's working. I know. I mean, I promise this thing makes awesome sounds. Like you just need to know how to use it really well, and I haven't used it that much. Alto, um, because it has these amazing presets. Um, that are licensed to my friend Jeff. Um, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, but I just can't find the presets anymore. Oh, maybe maybe Kaivo has presets. Maybe does this one have presets? There's a whole other thing to make that with audio synth. You make that with audio I uh, the, no, the, all these other audio units are Apple devices. Oh, so okay, this is great. I think I figured this out. So Kaibo has the presets, so we can use Kaibo. It, um, hold on a second. I, I need to at least show you that this makes great sounds. Um, This is great. 
they have great like <laughs> A few of them were working by themselves, like, uh, which one? No, 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 it's actually not generating exam. Annoyed cat baby. You don't want to know that one. That's like... So like, okay, let's find some, some of these that... pitch sustain I obviously should have prepared this a little more. <laughs> Alright, skip it. Anyway, skip it. The point is, like, you get the idea. Like, if, you, if you're if you an audio person, you could load up on... Uh, oh, great. Let me just... Um, <laughs> let me just make sure that this will not eat. There we go. Okay. So this is just the face tracker. So we can use this in the same way that we use CubNet Predictor. So I'm going to say like, um, let's add categorical slides. Uh, three, one categorical slide will have three classes. Three. So we'll say um, one is like this. So record one. <laughs> now we'll switch to two. Oh, wait, this way. Um, um Oh, you know what? I want four classes. Yes, sorry, sorry, sorry. Let's, let's do this one more time. I'm gonna get out of this. Four classes, I'm gonna show you because I, I remember exactly the demo I wanna do. So, categorical with four classes. So first, left. Basically leaning left. This is one. Now this is two. Now three will be horizontal normal. Or sorry, like like just normal. And the last one is going to be the same thing, but open mouth. Now let's train that. And it's trained. So, okay, predict. One, two, Okay, good. So now, um, now I'm going to open an application called Keyboard OSC, which will take triggers from here. So basically, it'll receive on 12,000. So wait, what is this? It's going to send. It, so we got to change this to be port 12,000 slash wax slash outputs and now we'll say that one 
is left, two is right, three is pass, and four is space. So space bar. So now, um, basically, the idea should be that um, I'm gonna, like, let's do this. I'm gonna try to play this with my face. So here's the idea. Um, this is always comp complicated pipeline. So allow keyboard stimulation. Simulation. And now in theory, Access. This is new. Keyboard OSC. And how do I get? Uh huh. Oh, see, this is all like a lot of this is super new. Where did I put this? But it's not this, it's okay, fine. <laughs> um, so now, in theory, well, let's see, is it actually working? So this is predicting. Yes, it is. You can see I'm moving to the right. <laughs> Space bar, right? OK, let's do this. Okay, wait, even better. Or, or, um, well, I don't remember where this is anymore. Basically, I tried to, is this actually it? Yeah, look at that. What? Oh, this is Mario Kart 64. So this is like really complicated. Uh, I basically stopped once the new games had more than two buttons. Like, so like. Mario Grand Prix. Select your player. Let's go. Okay. This is gonna take too long. Like the point is, like if you map the keys to the ones that you have, you can you can actually like basically <laughs> play video games. Um, I'm sorry. What's that? Yeah, like I I did it to the space bar. Basically, I said like I assigned class four to space through uh, in keyboard OSC. You just go to this change settings, and then you know, yeah. Um, and there's there's um, there's more detailed instructions on this. If you go to guides, and then uh, not keyboard OSC, what is it? Um, how do we do this? Actually, can't remember now. Basically. 
Maybe it's in. I thought we did did have a guide for. Oh, maybe we don't have a guide for this. I thought we had something like that. Um, oh, you know what? I think we have it under audio. Yeah. Yeah, then, then it does actually have instructions for Because we did this originally for audio classifier, and I do a lot of demos, but for me right now, my audio classifier, actually, this will be a good test. Open audio classifier, which is here. And uh, if you open it, you should see like audio, like I see nothing right now. Does anyone see, does everyone else see nothing or? You do? Okay, so for some reason it's my, my thing that's screwed up. So you can actually train audio classifier. There's instructions for how to do this. We don't have time, but um, this will recognize different audio samples. So, okay, so like one thing that Andreas did, he, tra he trained audio classifier and keyboard OSC to play Wolfenstein online. So that's the idea. Um, there's a few more things that we're out of time, so I, I want to just really quickly wrap up. Um, there's maybe a few more things that I'll try to bring in next week, but uh, for now, let's also just quickly. So yeah, you saw Doodle Classifier, you saw um, Keyboard OSC. I know some of the details might be a little bit weird, so like if anyone starts using those and has some questions, let me know. It's usually something really small, like like settings and XML, which which you may um, but might turn into a struggle if you don't, you know, let me know. Um, but those are all available for you. Here's another cool example, like you could do this with keyboard OSC. I did basically this except for the T-Rex game, but okay, you can play Tetris with your face. So that's that's another cool example. Anything you can control with your keyboard doesn't have to be games. Could be Photoshop. Could be whatever. Whatever, you know, like it basically is mapping keyboards uh, clicks on your, um, and yeah, this is, oh, this is kind of a dead project right now, so sorry. <laughs> I, we started doing some stuff with ML, like Raspberry, does anyone here use Raspberry Pi? Yeah. We, we have like some basic stuff going in the Raspberry Pi and this ML for Pi, but it's like, oh, like a year old, at least two years probably. But anyway, um, with Bjorn, who's uh, another friend. Okay, so just a review, like, um, again, obviously, like, this is not next week yet, but um, you'll have two weeks to prepare this while I'm gone, but just start thinking, for now, just start thinking about little hacks that you can do um, for the midterms, and uh, that's kind of what we'll, we'll be gearing up for. Um, next week, we're going to get into Deep Dream and stuff like that, so it'll be kind of a big change of, change of gears. I might still have a few last minute We'll probably get straight into this. I might show one or two things that we missed today, but mostly we'll get into this kind of stuff. Um, okay, cool. I'll see you guys next week. Cool. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you.